Hey everybody! It's two o'clock Central Standard Time, and once again, it is time for the Monday edition of the Mike Myers COVID Virus live stream. Ask Mike anything. The goal of this live stream is to provide those of us who are isolated by the coronavirus an opportunity to continue our studies on CompTIA certifications. In particular, we concentrate on A+, Network+, and Security+, but we're also very careful. Thank you, Elbo, for letting me know my sound's good. Uh, we're also here to answer just about any question you want. Uh, we stay away from religion and politics, but other than that, you're probably okay. Somebody bumped my camera, and I'm all skewered. It's driving me nuts, and I just noticed it now. So you're going to have to have an unbalanced image today. Uh, we got a pretty light day today. Um, we're going to do some IPv6 subnetting, but that's... Compared to IPv4 subnetting, IPv6 subnetting is much easier. Um, so that'll be good. Um, I've, I've, got, I've got a few questions uh, that came in over the email, but none that I can really easily answer. Again, a lot of people are, I'm, I'm starting to wonder, are people like ganging up, Mike, what is my certification path? That's coming up a lot. Uh, and I still don't have all the answers for it, but I'm working on it, guys, so we'll get there. Uh, so we may have a shorter day today. <coughs> it's never a problem. Mike is unbalanced. I am unbalanced, that's for sure. Let's scroll up and see if any questions we got here. Uh, okay, so guys, do keep in mind that uh, I'm see I see a couple of names I don't recognize in here, which is always good. Welcome to new folks. Uh, so the, the trick here is you ask me questions and I answer them. So you ask questions by typing them here into the live chat. Uh, I only look at live chat. I understand there's another way to look at it. Uh, there's top chat and there's live chat. I, I stick with live chat because, I don't know, it feels better. And uh, so ask me questions, just type them in there. Uh, if I miss a question, it's not that big of a deal. I got both my buddy Scott Jernigan and Dave Rush helping me out, plus the usual cast of thousands are here uh, to help things out. So if I miss a question, it's no big deal, guys. Just, just type it, and you're in good shape. Uh, so uh, now, But for some of us, I understand some of us might be a little shy. If, that's, if you're shy, it's no big deal. Just send me an email. So email at uh, michaelm at totalsem.com and uh, write it out and we can uh, answer the questions there. So it's always easy to do. It's not a big deal. Uh, by the way, if you're a gamer, I'm Senior Pepe on Steam and I'm Des Weds on just about everything. So, all right, with that attitude in mind, uh, Scott tells me I'm not crooked. I know I'm crooked. If you look at my head, you can see that there's two bookshelves over here and one bookshelf over here. I'm crooked. All right, so let's see if we got some questions coming in. Chaco Tacos here, John Batman, Jim Barham, Elbow and Andre, Tolowe, all the Gruber Accountant Z. Uh, 202, if I'm using BitLocker and I want to store data in a cloud service on an encrypted basis, would BitLocker prevent me from doing that? Nope, not at all. You gotta remember the thing about BitLocker is that BitLocker unencrypts the moment you pull, you open the file. So, you know, when you're saying you store data in a cloud, that means you have to open the data and then you would have to have it re-encrypted. Would like dragging and dropping cause any problem? Could, right answer is I don't know. My first swipe at this is that whatever utility you're using to move your data from your local system to your cloud would, oh, sorry, here it comes again, not enough coffee, would unlock the BitLocker and, and you're almost certainly fine. It's interesting, it's, I've got BitLocker on this system right here. Hang on, we're gonna give this a quick try. Open up a folder. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to copy into, uh, what have I got here, Dropbox? Got a very unhappy Dropbox. All right. Seems to copy fine, doing a drag and drop, but I'm using the, the uh, Dropbox app. 
So I think the answer to your question is, uh, Gruber Accountancy, it's going to be a, on a case by case basis. Got to remember, BitLocker only keeps it encrypted when it's not being opened. So the moment you open something, it can go anywhere you want. It's, it's unencrypted. Mm -mm -mm. Do -do -do. Edwin is here. Hey, uh, hey, Edwin. Jim Barham, question. Could you do a security best practices session? Uh, no. Uh, Jim, we'd have to talk about what aspect of security do you want to do best practices on? I could do an entire session just on best practices for IT security for creating users. That would be one thing I could do it on. We could do a best practices on wireless networking security. We could do a best practices on active directory for small network security. We could do a security uh, best practices on physical security and HVAC. See where I'm coming from? So when you ask me a question like that, you're, you're not making it detailed enough. Uh, IT security is a massive topic and I can talk about best practices in hundreds of different ways depending on what you're looking for. So, uh, sorry man, but Jim, that isn't to say don't answer, ask your question. What it does mean is make it more detailed and just ask it again. We'll get you there, man. John Batman. What would, I'm Batman. What would be the best solution to keep Windows from locking my storage drive when performing a massive upgrade? John Batman says, what would be the best solution to keep Windows from locking my storage drive when per a mass you're upgrading Windows and it's locking something up? Uh, Windows 10 installation and upgrade processes are incredibly robust. So if you're telling me that you have, when it says, when you say locking your storage drive, John Batman, when you say lock, are you actually getting a encryption lock? Uh, is it just not responding? Uh, we'd have to have more details. John, you're upgrading from blah to blah. Uh, you have a Linux system, you're upgrading to Windows 10. You got an old Windows 8 system that you finally got around to upgrading to Windows 10. You're just doing your usual Windows up 10. I don't even know what a storage drive is. Are you talking like a rotational media drive that's a secondary to an NVMe M.2? Sure, okay. But you're gonna, uh, John, I'm very interested in answering your question, but you're gonna have to give me more details. Massey Ion. Hi, sir. Hey, Massey. Hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Edward is here. Mahmoud Yurt Server. This is a new look. What do I look like? This is an old look. <laughs> Andre, do it. Can you explain how Subdaddy works? Nope. Massey Ion, can you please explain the thin users? I don't know what a thin user is, man. I got no clue. I'm way too fat to be a thin user. Generally, a thin user is going to be, well, you don't say a thin user. You'd say a thin client. So a thin client is any type of client system where most of the computational work is being done on a remote system. Uh, so normally when we say thin client, we're talking about a hardware type of thing uh, where you have a particular type of PC that like it has, almost, has either zero or no mass storage on it because it's doing all the computational work remotely. It probably has a small amount of RAM. It's basically just acting as a terminal. But if technically though, a thin client doesn't have to be the hardware. A thin client can just be how the software reacts to the serving system. I could have a super high-end PC and if I'm just doing a simple web browser, that web browser really is a thin client at that point uh, because I may have all these, all this RAM and hard drive and video cards and sound and RGB, but when I'm running my browser, I don't use any of that. So we could look at it that way as well. 
See, now here's the question. So, you, so Massey, you asked me this question. Now the question I want is, why are you asking me this question, Massey? Because so many times, once I understand why people are asking me a question, I can usually do a better job answering it because it just helps. Um, trying to prevent prying eyes from drop, Dropbox EEs. Gruber, you having a real pro I, I'm just not super paranoid about Dropbox. Um, I don't know what EE means. Dropbox EE. Let me look that up. Scott, do you have any idea what he's talking about there? Dropbox EE. Uh, Gruber, sorry, buddy. I'm not sure what you're asking about. Uh, Andre, Gruber Accountancy. Okay. Gruber Accountancy, 206 p.m. Security Plus course is great. Thank you, sir. Tanya Jacobson, wish you did CISSP training. Well, Tanya, keep around. Just because I may not be personally doing it, Total Seminars is always looking at things. So uh, stay on this channel. You never know. Charles Lamine Mane. Mane. What are your book that you can advise me for CompTIA Plus? I'm talking about the complete exam, not only core one and two. Okay, well, Charles, uh, you're talking about the CompTIA A Plus. You can't just say CompTIA, right? CompTIA has like 40 different certifications. But you're talking about the CompTIA A Plus certification. And you're talking about the complete exam, not only core one and two. Uh, Charles, for the CompTIA A+, there are only two exams, the core one and the two. So it's the, uh, I, I can never keep them apart. It's the 220-1001 and 220-1002 are the current ones. They are the complete exam. If you take those two, you have taken the complete exam. You get the certification and the secret handshake and the fancy hat. Mm -hmm. Kenny Israel, Mike, can you send a link for your email so I can email you on specific topics for A+. Sure, Kenny, right here, brother. Michael M at totalsim.com. That's me, baby. Although, do keep in mind, Kenny, you're always welcome to ask questions here. Uh, it doesn't matter. However you want to do it, whatever makes you most comfortable, I'm happy with. Man, I slept bad on my neck last night, and I've got one of those where it hurts up here and like goes all the way down to about here. Ugh. Ugh. Ouch. <laughs> Choco Taco. User creation best practice would be super interesting, considering coming from a guy who creates users for a living. Choco Taco, I'm going to put you on here on a Zoom meeting. You can teach that one. Jim Brown, could we look at how to set up a small Active Directory environment for SMB, then secure it? Maybe 25 users, Windows 10 Pro clients? Sure. Uh, So when you say, a, uh, so this is Jim Barham at 207, how to set up a small Active Directory environment for SMB. Now, we've done that. Uh, we have videos on that. Uh, then secure it. Active Directory out of the box is one of the most secure protocols that exists. Uh, a well-patched and updated Windows server is an extremely secure device. I mean, I can, most protocols, there's somebody who can get around it one way or another, but Kerberos, I've, I've never come up with a tool for me to get around Kerberos. Uh, for me to hack into Windows servers, it usually is a matter of me trying to get physically to the server somehow or get a remote connection into the server. And that's about the only place where any kind of weaknesses show up in my experience. Uh, maybe 25 users? Sure. It doesn't really matter. Windows 10 Pro clients. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Jim, what I recommend you do is watch, uh, Scott Jernigan, can you pull up those videos we did on, uh, so Jim, what we were doing is we we're trying to teach people how to use uh, virtualization tools, like uh, I use VirtualBox, uh, mainly because it's free, it comes from Oracle, it works great, I got nothing against other ones, I just know this one, and uh, we went ahead and set up a private network 
and then we set up some Linux boxes and some Windows 10 systems. And then I showed you guys how to download uh, and install a Windows Server system for free. Uh, but that's already been done here, Jim. So I, I'm reticent to repeat it. I would be much more interested in, Jim, you watching those videos and then coming back to me with questions on any particular details you might want me to deal with. Uh, Scott, Scott Jernigan will put that up. Or Dave Rush did. There it is. Thank you, Dave. EE -E, e -E is employees? EE -E is employees. Huh. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Without him. Dude, Gruber Accountancy, we're going to have to talk because now we're. T you have a problem with employees over at Dropbox? You know something I don't know. Mm -mm -mm. Ah, John Batman. Here we go. Now we're starting to get some answers here. John Batman, hardware upgrade that locks my storage drive. John, one more thing and then we'll be okay. What the hell's a storage drive? What, that's not a common term. So in my computer, on like a desktop system, I'll have a couple of uh, SSD drives in there, which might be called boot drives, but even that's not universal. So when you say your storage drive, are you just talking about a hard drive? Do you have like two or three hard drives and you call one of them a storage drive? Your, your terminologies are confusing to me, but we'll get the answer. Just bear with me. Keep trying, John. We'll get there. Uh, Jim Brown, thinking about backup and dual ISP and failover. Backup, okay. Man, that's a big topic, Jim. We have uh, a gal who did a wonderful video on a lot of this stuff. Uh, I'm going to, man, I'm going to lean on Scott Journey again, again. Scott, can you pull up the video that we have? We have a, a course for, it's a Microsoft course. Uh, and uh, I'm just going blank. I cannot remember the instructor's name or anything, but she does a great job and I'd recommend it. So Windows locked his M.2 boot drive. I have not heard of that happening. And you say the word locked. So when someone tells me locked, that means either it's something has been frozen and no longer in motion, which would be bad. Uh, in, in, in the computer world, I tend to use the word froze up when something is suddenly just not working and I can't really reset it or something. But uh, you're going to have to use a different word other than uh, locked. Uh, what's happening during this installation that you know there's a problem? We'll get there. This happens all the time. Don't panic, guys. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I don't, I don't know why Windows would lock an M.2 boot drive. I'm un, John, I'm unfamiliar with Windows doing that. So most of the time when someone says, well, Windows locked my, first I'm going to go, what the hell does locked mean? And secondly, I'm going to go, how do you know it's Windows? And this is one of these things where I had my Star Trek transporter beam and I could stand behind the person while this process is going on. And John, I could probably get some better answers. Uh, this is a complicated, as you can tell by me having asked so many questions, it's kind of a complicated issue, but keep trying. We'll give it a whirl. Uh, a couple of things do be aware of, guys. Uh, we do want you to like and subscribe on this channel, please. It, it's extremely helpful. So just go here to Total Seminars channel, like them if you like them, and subscribe. And that just makes everything more wonderful for me and keeps me motivated. Also, do keep in mind that we have specials today. Uh, we have 20% um, off A+, plus, Net+, plus, and Security+, plus Passport eBooks. So this is all my passport books, the compressed books. Um, the, uh, go to www.totalsem.com, and all you got to do is head over to the merchant area, load some of those books up into your cart, and just before you check out, use the code WINTER2021. So you get books. So this is a good thing. I'm happy, bunch. 
Um, Gruber Accountancy, with the supposed security, security superiority of Apple, why are you an Android guy? Because I like, flexibi I like flexibility. Um, I install a lot of applications here that are APK files. I don't use a store, which uh, Apple is very reticent about. I can actually root this, this phone and get utilities and tools that you would have no hope of getting in an Apple world. I'm not against Apple's. If I, if I had to teach somebody who didn't know anything about smartphones, I, I would hand them an Apple device before I'd hand them an Android device. Uh, I got no problem with Apple. I just think Android has far more flexibility for somebody like me. Jim Brown, uh, question, do you have any thoughts on the best group policy items to restrict for just my personal device? No, Jim, I, I'm, on personal devices, I tend to leave those very much wide open. Um, you lock things down because you are the administrator of those things and you don't want people messing them up. That's why things get locked down. You go up to a kiosk at some show and there's somebody's got a computer there, but it's all locked out. Uh, it'll only run the demo or whatever it might be. It's because somebody else is administering it and wants to prevent people from doing stupid things. So on my own personal equipment, I tend to do little to no lockdown because I want, I, there won't be anybody stupid other than myself potentially to do anything wrong. Um, So this is interesting. So you say for my personal device, but now you start talking about family members. So what we're probably talking about here, Jim, is that you have shared devices. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't worry a lot about locking down individual systems too much. Um, if, you, if your users are set up as guest users, they're not going to have the ability to do just, I mean, if you're we're really talking about, you really want to lock something down. Most of the time, if you just create guest users and enable guest, enable the guest account, uh, you get a lot of, you get a lot of uh, really good uh, features. Um, like, you're ta like you're talking about not having them hit on control panel. How about not having them open up a command line? Uh, there's a lot of tools like that uh, that uh, would really allow you to do it. I'm going to warn you, though, that if you want to start making those kind of lockdowns as a group policy in Windows, you're going to open up a hill of beans because what's going to happen is unless you have really granular control on your users, people are going to start yelling at you like all the time. And you have no idea, family members, uh, when one of your kids or your spouse they never told you that they needed this particular weird app that's giving you trouble. Um, my bigger thing that I would do there, Jim, is I would be more interested in uh, making sure people sign on. Uh, it surprises me how little that that's used anymore. Um, and you can turn it off in Windows, and a lot of people do, especially if they're running Windows Home. I think Windows Home shouldn't exist, personally. Um, I, I, yeah, that, 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 that's another longer question. Gruber Accountancy. Mm -hmm. Looks like you guys are all talking to each other. Andre, so basically a thin client is just a remote control for a virtual machine or some kind of server somewhere. It doesn't even have to be a virtual machine, right? Uh, it could be a, it could just be a client to a, a real machine somewhere. It could be just acting like terminal software for an SSH server. You're just not leaning on the internal processing or storage of a thin client. I mean, that, that's what defines a thin client. So it could be a virtual machine on the other side, but it doesn't have to be.
Just looking at questions. Just looking for questions. Hang on, guys. Groover Accountancy. With SSL and TLS, I am confident I'm speaking to the server on a secure communication. Sure. But is the server guaranteed that they'll be talking to me since a CI hasn't certified me? No. Uh, well, it's a little bit. I mean, if you take a look at most, I don't even want to use the word SSL, but at this level, it's actually pretty much identical. Uh, the actual handshake that takes place um, really only confirms the server. But if you have to think about this, it's really the server, the, the server at eBay trusts you, or at least as much as its internal authentication will allow you. The eBay servers, when you go to eBay, you have a username and a password, all right? And they have confidence that if you can type in the right username and password, that you are who you are. We don't share that interest. And the, the greater, what, what's the word? The greater threat is on me to use eBay, not eBay to use me, right? Because uh, I'm the one handing out credit cards and things like that. Uh, so the bottom line is, is the server guaranteed that they'll be talking to me since the CA hasn't certified me? Nope, they'd have not But for the record, you can do that. Nobody does. But it is perfectly functional, built into lots of protocols. SSL, TLS is only one of them. You can do it in wireless, where each individual host, laptop, or however you're doing your stuff, has its own certificate. It's not done. Uh, Sean McLaughlin, the 213. I got your Network Plus Series Plus videos last week. I'm very happy with them. Enjoyed watching them. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for coming aboard. Vista Chris. Mike, am I allowed to write down notes during the Network Plus tests, such as scratching down notes to help me with the subnetting questions? Yeah, but if you're doing the home testing, all you get is notepad on a screen. So uh, you don't get a handy piece of paper. You just get to be able to jot on the screen. But you can st it still works. You just... 128, space, 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 64, all that kind of stuff. Still works fine. Maybe a Xanax would help your deck. Oh, Xanax. Ah, recreational drugs. So, like a trillion years ago, I, I was this. I, I had I had gone without sleeping for three nights. I know when you hear people say, oh, I didn't sleep for... Two nights. It's like, well, I actually it took a lot. I didn't sleep. I did not sleep for three nights. It is the fourth day. I'm hallucinating badly. And I finally go into the doctor and I'm like, I got these terrible chest pains, but I've been tested for everything. This is 15 years ago, guys. I'd been tested for everything. I mean, everything. And the doctor is sitting there looking at me and I'm just like a wreck and sweat's pouring down me. And the doctor's like, stay here, I'll be right back. And he comes back in with a bar of Xanax, which I had no idea what any of this was. He goes, here, just take this pill. If it's going to work, it's going to work in 15 minutes. And um, I'm like, okay. So the doctor, I take this pill in the doctor's office. And 15 minutes later, my pain was gone. It was gone. And this doctor, he was somewhere between... Dr. Kildare and Marcus Welby and House and I don't know, Doogie Hauser. He was like the greatest doctor ever known to man. And I go up to the doctor and I'm, I'm, as you can imagine, I'm relaxed for the first time in three days so I can these horrible pains that I had. And the doctor's like, uh, no, it's, it's not a painkiller. It's a fast-acting serotonin inhibitor, alapramazod better known as Xanax. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Xanax is terrifyingly impressive stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Just reading. Massey Island, because recently I enrolled in your A-plus courses. Thank good courses, sir. Well, Massey, you gotta re you're going to have to remind me of the question, even I forget. No, no, no. Taran Chada. Hi, Mike. I cleared core one with an 83. 833, that's an amazingly high score. Got an interview for IT support role. Seemed to be overqualified. My response was, I love troubleshooting. Yeah, dude, get a job. Jim Brown, additional item about Active Directory question. What endpoint protection would you use for the workstations? I, 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 would, I would use the, the firewall. Uh, and you have some anti-malware on there. You don't really have to do a whole lot. I mean, Windows 10 Active Directory Network is a incredibly robust network out of the box. But Jim, we could talk. Look, Jim, do me a favor. I'm willing to do this. But, uh, whoops, wrong, 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 wrong here. Jim, send me an email. Uh, why don't we flesh out what you're looking for here? You're, you're giving me some interesting pieces, Jim Baron, and I think that we could have an interesting Active Directory uh, discussion on this. Uh, but, Jim, please send me an email at michaelrevittotalsim.com, and let's flesh this out a little bit. And I think between you and I, we can probably come up with something very interesting that other people would enjoy as well. IP addresses. This is 2.25 p.m. Do switches have IP addresses since they're primarily using UDP? Switches are not primarily using UDP, Gruber. Why do you say that? See, it's always a thing. Because, I mean, I can just answer your question, but what I want to say is, why do you say switches don't use UDP? Switches don't use IP. Switches are a layer two device. They use MAC addresses. The only time uh, switches get an IP address is so you can communicate with them to configure VLANs and things like that. We call that a managed switch. But switches don't use any of that. Typing on Tawanda. Hello, everyone. I'm a beginner day plus, and I'm hoping I can learn and pass. Da -da 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 -da. Absolutely. Welcome aboard. Andres Neri, Uncle Mike, Uncle Mike. I'm struggling to understand what is the difference between rapid electricity and on demand uh, cloud services, and also the metered and measured terms. Uh, difference between rapid electricity and on-demand. Okay, so rapid ele elasticity and on-demand don't necessarily have to be different things. But they're talking about different aspects of what could be considered the same thing. So normally when we talk about rapid elasticity on, on uh, cloud services, we're talking about a, uh, the ability for how quickly the services can build up and build back down. So uh, on demand is very similar to rapid elasticity and uh, sorry, I'm making bad noises. Uh, where was I? So they, they, they're, they're very similar. You can, you can use them in the same, same vein. Also, the metered and measured terms. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't know what the difference is between metered and measured. See if somebody says anything at me on that one. I don't know. Did I say a, a, a 228 Gruber Accountancy in your Security Plus courses? You mentioned a secure Windows version. Other than Windows 10, man, I'm gonna have to read. Scott Jernigan, did I tell somebody that there's a more secure Windows 10 version? That would make me unhappy if I said that. I, 
forget all the names. Bear with me, guys. I'm getting all the uh, numeric versions. Windows E? Somebody's going to have to give me the uh, source right to say that there's a more secure version of Windows because I'll probably delete that right away. All right, Scott, have I stopped clipping and buffering? I think I'm a little bit fixed up here. Sorry, Gruber. Uh, yeah, Gruber, please send me a link for that. I, I'd very much like to see exactly where I say that. Android does not have a SE Linux, Tarun. All right. So I'm assuming I'm done buffering Scott Jernigan. I need you here. I'm just going to call Scott Jernigan. Sometimes he doesn't answer fast enough. Hang on, kids. Yes, Mike. How do I sound now? All right, thanks, buddy. Bye. Richard Willis, lots of buffering. Guys, it's my understanding the buffering has ended. Plus, I just got a call from Scott Jernigan saying the buffering has ended. I'm showing that I have a great link. So uh, hopefully we are okay now. All right, anyway, let's go ahead and uh, cover through. Uh, let's talk about IPv6 subnetting. Uh, one thing I need to tell you, uh, uh, for those of you just joining in, we've been doing subnetting for like the previous three sessions. So if you're curious about IPv4 subnetting, Watch the previous three videos. We do a lot of it in there, and I think you'll find it very interesting. Uh, but today I want to talk about IPv6 subnetting. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is IPv6 subnetting is a lot easier than IPv4 subnetting. Number one, you have much more granularity, okay? Number two, you have a fixed subnet mask in IPv6. Your end nodes all have a WAC64 subnet. All of them. There's no exception to that. So you don't have the equivalent of little internal networks with, you know, WAC 30s and WAC 29s and WAC 26 subnets. It doesn't happen in IPv6 because, again, the smallest subnet you could possibly have is a WAC 64. Remember, IPv6 is 128. Guys, I'm assuming you know a little bit about IPv6. If not, there is a excellent... Uh, uh, YouTube video on IPv6 in here, uh, I, here in Total Seminars channel. I recommend to watch this. But I'm expecting, uh, uh, oh, and Andre, the nice part is, uh, WAC64, you don't have to write out anything in binary with IPv6 because uh, everything's in hexadecimal. So there's no weird dotted decimal. And if you have a very basic understanding of hexadecimal, there is no conversion. Let me show you. Let's just go into the PowerPoint and I'll show you what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some IPv6 subnetting. It's just as common as IPv4. ISPs and enterprises, they'll subnet IPv6. Um, DHCP, DHCP v6 is a good solution for SOHO IPv6 network IDs, but in the enterprise and with ISPs, you're still going to be doing old school subnetting, all right? Uh, and in general, IPv6 is, subnetting is a lot easier than IPv4, mainly because you don't have to convert things to binary and back. All right, so let's start off by taking a look at a typical IPv6 
in this case, we're going to call this a network ID. So I don't know how much I want to review this. IPv6 is hexadecimal characters. All right. There's eight groups of four hexadecimal characters separated by seven colons. You can see here, this is the network ID part of an end node network. That's 64. So each one of these is four, four times 16 is 64. All the X's at the end, that's what your own network card puts in there. So we could ignore that part. All right. So that part, we just skip it. All right. So we have 128 bit address. It's always a WAC 64 at that. That's really where IPv6 subnetting comes in. Uh, do remember that each one of these hexadecimal characters is four bits. And every, every four characters is 16 bits. So that's 16 bits right there. These four right here, that's 16 bits. So let's take a look at some network IDs. Now, if we take a look, here's the one I just drew up here. Remember, when you see double colon, that means it's all zeros after that. But I can do some other ones that are kind of interesting. For example, I can do 2600. That's, that's a WAC 16. That's 16 right there. I can do 2600 colon 1234. That's a WAC 32. Remember, each group of four is 16 characters. That's what I just said. And then we can do some addresses. Well, number one, we have tons. So that's a nice thing. Uh, so it's pretty easy to get that. But uh, also keep in mind with IPv6, number one, you have to uh, assign every one of your networks a legitimate IPv6 address. There is no, there's not really NAT with IPv6. When it's done right, your router will advertise what your network ID is. And then you just screw on your uh, original information at the end of that, those uh, 16 X's at the end. So on individual home networks and small office networks, any individual network, you're counting on the router, your upstream router to advertise what your network ID is. And then you basically fill out the uh, last 64 bits. In the ISP world, which is, you know, a lot of this happens, uh, the internet guys are usually issued more often than not. We're going to see like WAC 48 addresses, uh, WAC 48, WAC 52, WAC 56, and WAC 60, which are then turned into WAC 64s. So let me show you how this works. All right. So Here's an example of a WAC 48 address. Notice that there's only three sets of characters in here. Do you see this? We're, we're lacking the, the fourth set. Here's an example of a WAC 52. Oh, by the way, each one of these is four, right? Each group of four is 16. So do the math here. Three times 16 is 48. 16, 32, 48, plus another four. Remember, you see that as a one. That's a hexadecimal character. That could be that could be a C. That could be a nine, right? So that's another four characters. So this increments by four. Here is 26, 7, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, colon, 1, 2. This is a WAC 56. And here's an example of a WAC 60. And then, uh, so basically, your subnetting questions boil down to, with most IPv6 subnets, you're going to start with someone's going to hand you a WAC 48, a WAC 52, a WAC 56, or a WAC 60, and then you've got to break it down into WAC 64 network IDs. This is important to keep in mind, folks, because when we were doing IPv4, a lot of the IPv4 your stuff you're doing is, if I have, you know, I start with this network ID, if I break it down into six hosts, six subnets, how many hosts will I have? With IPv6, we never care about how many hosts you have because the number of hosts you have is going to be 2 to the 64th power every time. It's a 128-bit address. Half of that is WAC64 is the subnet. The other 2 to the 64, 2 to the 64 minus 2, which is some big number. The bottom line is you will never get an IPv6 subnet question that's going to ask you how many hosts, ever. Won't do it. But what they are going to do is they're going to say, I'm going to start with a WAC48 or a WAC 52, and then I want to subnet it into something, all right? So uh, let's go ahead. Hopefully you've got some pen and paper on you.
I'm just reading what you guys are saying. And uh, let's go ahead and try a few uh, the kind of subnetting questions you might see out there. You ready? Here we go. Oopsie. Oh, no. I messed up the animation. Oh, well, here we go. We can still do this. All right. So here you go, guys. Here's the question. You ready? So I've got a subnet mask of, I'm sorry, I have a network ID of 2600 colon 1234 colon 5678 colon 48. How many, 50, how many WAC 52 subnets can I make? This is not hard. So let's start the count. One hexadecimal character in there, folks. That's not a, a binary character. That's hexadecimal, okay? So that hexadecimal character can go from zero to one. I'm skipping a bunch all the way to E and F. So you can make 16 subnets, WAC 52. So how do I know it's a WAC 52? Uh, okay. All right, hang on, guys. I, I'm getting so many people giving me... I'm giving so many people are telling me they're buffering that uh, I'm being distracted by that. And I'm going to now switch gears for a minute. We're going to stop talking about subnetting and let's see if we can deal with this buffering issue. Just checking some settings here to make sure I've got this set up right. Forty nine, yeah. So I'm getting nothing but good signs. In fact, the only The only warning I'm getting is that the amount of data I'm sending is too low. <laughs> I need to send something higher. Ah! All right. Guys, I'm very sorry. I apologize to those of you who are buffering. Uh, I feel that my internet connection is in perfect order. I feel... Okay, so what's happening here is... Uh, now. A lot of us will look at this and we know that this value here, that's actually four binary digits. And a lot of people are going to say to me, Mike, could I do like a WAC 49 or a WAC 50 or a WAC 51? You can. It's extremely rare to see that, uh, mainly because we're so early in IPv6 that we can work at the individual hexadecimal characters. But there are ways. It's absolutely possible. You're not going to see it on any CompTIA A+, Net+, or Security+. But there are ways to subnet where you're going uh, off of the individual characters. Have like a WAC 49 or a WAC 53, but you won't see any questions like that. Let's return to this and take a look at it one more time. All right, so, so we move this over one character, which is four binary characters. That's why we go from a WAC 48 to a WAC 52. We've moved it over four characters, okay? So you could make from 0 to F is 16. So you can make 16 WAC 52 subnets from a WAC 48. All right, let's do it again. Let's see if the animations, uh, my animations are all messed up. All right, so here is a um, 2001 3ACA colon 91B3 colon AC 56. How, how many 64 subnets can I make? All right. So in this case, we move it over two characters to go from 56 to 64. We're adding eight binary values, right? From 56 to 64. So we're adding eight binary values. So it can go from 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0 all the way to F, E, F, F. So the answer is it's 16 times 16 is 256. So if you start with a WAC 56 and you want to make how many 64s, you could make 256. I believe that. Yeah, that's all we got. 
So submenu with IPv6 is actually pretty trivial. The, the question then comes in is that, okay, so I do the subnetting. Where do I punch the subnetting in? Well, usually you're either loading in a bunch of WAC64 subnets for individual customers, which will then be part of a router advertisement. When the uh, routers boot up, it's typed in statically uh, in, in higher level networks and among networking hardware. Boy, after learning about IPv4, IPv6 is almost anticlimactic, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's much easier. That's the only kind of questions you're going to run into. All right, guys. I don't know. I'm, I'm a little upset that I've, I'm getting a... Yeah, it looks like the buffering is really going to be causing troubles today. So I'm going to wrap it up early today. Guys, uh, I am sorry about the buffering. I don't think I did it today. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday. I have no primary topics for Wednesday. I am still working aggressively on uh, putting together a listing of uh, certifications, but this could end up taking months. Uh, but uh, yeah, so sorry about all the buffering. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and try to make a repair uh, immediately. I will be back uh, this Wednesday talking about something fun. Do you remember this Friday? Uh, Dave Rush will be on. So until this Wednesday at 2 o'clock, this is little Uncle Mikey saying good night. I'm going to try to play with some of this buffering. I'll talk to you guys later.